announcements before we get started. First of all, the Lutheran Church in town that we uh, have worked with before, they are having a chili fest and a silent pie auction on October 15th at 11 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. So if you want to go out there, chili will be $6 a bowl and then there'll be a silent auction for pies. There'll be baskets to raffle off. So if you want to go over there, hang out with our uh, friends at the Lutheran Church, get to know them a little bit and help them raise some money for their church and eat some good chili. I've been asked to invite you to that. Second of all, we have our Trunk or Treat event coming up, and hopefully the Lutheran Church is going to be helping us with that. We're still working out the details, but that's going to be on Halloween. I don't have the exact time yet, but I'll let you know as soon as possible. And if you have any donations for candy that you'd like to bring in, feel free. I think... We said last week make sure they're individually wrapped because a lot of there's a lot of concern going on around keeping kids safe, so we want to do that, but that'll be fun. And my last announcement is on the 23rd of October, it's a busy month, we have our church conference where we vote on all the things that we're going to do for next year for the church. So if you are a member, you are invited and you have a voice, so come to that. It's going to be right after the service on Sunday. So... Uh, one last thing I have, and I want to pan this over to Melinda. Where is she? Oh, in the choir. We discovered that we have a mold problem in our basement. And our kids usually meet down there, and we want to keep you guys safe and not have mold. So we're going to do what's called a noisy offering. make some noise. I was told to get so I only had, this is all I had, so I'm like the widow with the two bites, so I'm sorry. So out, out noise me.
Yeah, so this will go to the trustees fund to fix that mold. Yes. I love it whenever we do anything noisy in church. So, <laughs> so if you come up to me and ask, can we do noisy fill in the blank? I'll probably say yes. <laughs> now that we've done that, thank you all for helping us to take care of our kids and to take care of this building that God has given us. Let's start with a word of prayer and then we will continue with the rest of our worship. Holy God, you speak and the word and the world springs to life. Your words are precious to us. With your words, you teach us to walk in the path of life that leads to life eternal. Open our ears to hear your words in our lives today. Open our eyes to see where you are walking among us and guide our feet in the way that you would like us to go. That through us, you might heal our world. Amen. Oh, before I call up our uh, liturgist, I have a confession to make. I sent our secretary, Emma, the wrong information for the bulletin, and I didn't realize it until after she had printed the bulletin. So I think on a few of these, what's on the screen is going to be different from what we actually, what you have in your bulletin. So follow the screen. That should be correct. So <laughs> sorry to confuse our liturgist today, but we'll, we'll figure it out. Can read that small. I can read it. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. Please stand. Teach us, O Lord, the way of your statutes. Give us understanding, and we shall keep your law with our whole heart. Help us, O Lord, to walk in the path of your commandments. Incline our hearts to your testimonies and not to greed and selfishness. Turn away our eyes from meaningless things. Revive us. Let us hear your word and know your justice. O oh Lord, we long to hear your voice. Awaken us, we pray, to your ways of righteousness. Uh, please. Turn to your uh, Faith We Sing book number two. It's actually 467. I got that wrong, too. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> Turn to your hymnals, page 467, and join us in Trust and Obey. Thank you. 
Thank you. You may be seated. Our first reading today is from Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will, any, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. I realize I still have my keys around my neck. Now I can't take them off because I got this headset over them. All right. It is our children's time, and we're doing something special today. I'm not teaching. They're going to teach me and all of us. So I'm going to come down here, and I'm going to sit with you guys and watch. So those of you that might remember our Christian clowns, we're not really Christian clowns. Our story comes from 1 Samuel chapter 17. David was a young shepherd boy favored by God. David spent his time in a palace playing for playing his heart for King Saul. Saul was away fighting a war with the Philistines. David's brothers were soldiers fighting in King Saul's army. King Saul had a very big problem. A Philistine soldier named Goliath was a very big man. People called him a giant. He challenged the Israelites, I dare you to fight me. But the Israelites shook in fear. One day, David's father, Jesse, asked David to take supplies to his brothers. When David got there, he heard someone yell, Run for your lives! Ha! I knew it, yelled Goliath. The Israelites are cowards. Your God is weak. He can't help you. When David heard this, he became angry. David went to King Saul. Let me fight Goliath. Saul said, you can't fight Goliath. You are just a boy. David stuck out his chin. I've saved my sheep from lions and bears. So Saul gave David his armor and weapons. They were way too big, so he threw them down. Then David chose five smooth stones and his slingshot. Um, Goliath laughed and said, This is an insult. You dare send a boy to fight me. David said, You may have a sword and spear, but my weapon is God Almighty, the one you made fun of. David aimed his slingshot and hit Goliath in the head. The mighty giant fell to the ground. <laughs> a great battle was won that day because David trusted God. Thanks, guys. Is that? Oh my goodness! You guys are so talented. We got some actors in this group. Well, thank you all. As the kids sit down, make sure you tell them they did a good job after service. Uh, we are going to have our offering now, and this is our real offering, so it doesn't have to be as noisy, but. <laughs> But if you have anything else, and then after our offering, as you can see, we've got all these beautiful quilts out, and we will have our blessing of the quilts afterwards. So will our ushers please come forward?
please stand and receive our offering for today. than you, we could ever ask for. And the least we can do is offer back our time, our talents, and even our money to you. God, take this offering and bless it and use it to build your kingdom here on earth. Amen. Please remain standing. Oh, wait, we're going to do our quilt blessing. Oh, okay, good. So go ahead and Sorry. sit, unless you want to remain standing. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that wasn't in the bulletin because I okay. also okay. forgot to pull them up. So blame me because that was me. And that should be on the screen. If you want to explain, or do you want me to? Sure. The quilts are an ongoing project we've been doing since, I think, 2009. Uh, we went about the community asking where we could be of uh, good service to someone. Uh, the women's group started this, and their circle of love. and. What we found that hit our hearts the most was when the Head Start said, the kids need blankets. So we started in 19, oh, 2009 making these blankets. So we work year round every year. And the last two years we've made 76. That is their capacity. They've been full capacity. And so we will be delivering these blankets this week down to the Head Start for the kids to enjoy. Yeah, so if, there's, if you want to help with next year, talk to Lil. Could always use more people and you don't have to know how to sew even if you can just color that's all you need Aww. <laughs> that's accurate <laughs> She's thinking it. <laughs> Will you join me? Uh, we're going to read on the screen. My part's in the italics and your part is underneath. So, gracious God, we place our hands on these quilts and we join giver and receiver, recognizing the unity of all your people in the body of Christ. We celebrate being the children of God. We give thanks for the variety of gifts that compose these quilts, the donations of fabric, thread, and sewing machines, the faithful people who cut the squares, colored the squares, sewed the tops, ironed the fabric, made the backs and the fillers and the tie, and tied and stitched the bindings, and so much more effort that went into these. We celebrate generosity. We give thanks for the fellowship of all who worked together to make the quilts. The laughter, the shared stories, the joy of crafting something with one's own, one own, one's own hands and heart for another, and the time to reflect and wonder about the recipient. We celebrate community. We send these quilts as a sign of God's love and blessing for each person who receives one, trusting that their quilt will be a source of comfort and hope a symbol of Christ's love to those who suffer, a reminder that each recipient is a beloved child of God. We celebrate hope in the midst of life's trials. We ask that you bless the fruits of their labor and the whole mission of Hope UMC that together we may minister to our neighbors in need. Bless all who give, all who receive, as we are sown together in the unity of your Holy Spirit. One God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. I love today because it's just so much giving and <coughs> gratefulness. Makes me happy. Now, <laughs> we can turn that over. Please stand if you can and uh, let's sing. I, decided to, I have decided to follow Jesus.
Our second reading for today comes from Exodus chapter 19, and then I'm going to skip around. Uh, Actually, I think I'm only going to do 3 through 7 is what I decided during this week. So ignore (laughs) ignore that other part. Just just ignore everything that I sent in. (laughs) This was a long week. Let's see, 3 through 7. No, I'm only going to do the 20. Okay, that's it. All right, Exodus 20, 1 through 17 is what I'm doing. Israel is wandering in the desert, and then God speaks to them. God spoke all these words. He said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You must have no other gods before me. You must not make for yourself an idol, no form whatsoever of anything in the sky, above or in the earth below or in the waters under the earth. Do not bow down to them or worship them because I, the Lord, your God, am a passionate God. I punish children for their parents' sins, even to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. But I am loyal and gracious to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. Do not use God's name as if it were of no significance. The Lord your God won't forgive anyone who uses his name this way. Remember the Sabbath day and treat it as holy. Six days you may do work and do all your tasks, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Do not do any work on it, not you or your sons or your daughters, your male or female servants, your animals, or the immigrant who is living among you. Because the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and everything that is in it in six days, but rested on the seventh day. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and mother so that your life will be long on the fertile land that the Lord your God is giving you. Do not kill. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not testify falsely against your neighbor. Do not desire your neighbor's house. Do not desire and try to take your neighbor's wife, male or female servant, ox, donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. So the passage we read today is what we call often the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are interesting to me because I grew up in a house that had them hanging on the wall. 
I had to memorize them in Sunday school, which I know some of the kids have done before in the past, it sounds like. Back when I lived in Ohio, Toledo had uh, the Ten Commandments outside their courthouses. I don't know if they have that here. I don't think they do in Las Vegas, surprisingly. But <laughs> we talk quite a bit about something we call the Ten Commandments, and I don't think you have to have grown up in church to have heard of them. But what are these commandments really for? What are they really about? Now, the Ten Commandments have a lot to say about morality. Thou shall not kill or steal. They tell us what's right and what's wrong. But that's not the most important thing that the commandments do. What the, that's not what the real goal of the commandments are. You see, we often differentiate between law and grace. But the Ten Commandments are both law and grace. They not only teach us the laws we should follow, but first and foremost, most importantly, they teach us about the creator of those laws. So what do these commandments teach us about God? I don't know about you, but uh, at least for me, these commandments have become almost too familiar over the years. I can kind of quote all the thou shalt nots and and, and yet, I don't really stop and think about what they actually mean for me in my life. I think we like the idea of having Ten Commandments outside the courthouse because uh, we think that's where they need to be seen the most. We think they need to be seen by the criminals as kind of a finger pointing in their face saying, you shouldn't have killed, you shouldn't have stolen. But do we ever point that finger back at ourselves. What about me? What about us? Do we let these commandments speak to us? Do we let them lead us to the boundless grace of a God who can change our lives and our hearts? Or, or do we think those are for the criminals at the courthouse? Those are for the kids in Sunday school? I know sometimes I take them for granted. But as I studied for my sermon this week, I kept realizing to myself, wow, I've got a lot of work to do because <laughs> I'm not quite living up to all of these. And I, most of all, I've got a lot of grace that I need to pray for. So I want to go through these commandments one by one very briefly and look at each one and hopefully uh, in a way that will help us kind of see them anew and figure out what they might be saying to us today. Not to the criminals at the courthouse not to the, well, to the kids at Sunday school since they're in here with us, but not just to you kids, but to all of us. So let's start with number one. Number one, you shall have no other gods before me. This one is a lot more important than I think we realize. I don't think this commandment is just one of the ten, right? In fact, when we talk about, we talk about there being ten commandments, and if you look at the rest of the Bible, there's hundreds of other commandments that we could follow. But number one is really the commandment. Everything else that follows is just an elaboration of this one commandment. As Jesus said, the first and the greatest commandment is, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. And when he said that, I'm pretty sure he was referring to this commandment. You will have no other gods before me. This is what the rest of the commandments are all about. God is God. And if you remember that, everything else kind of falls into place. But in case you need a little bit more clarification about what it actually looks like for God to be God, we have number two. You shall not make, yourself, make for yourself any image to worship, any graven image. Now, what does that mean, graven image? Uh, there's a website I like called Enfleshed Theology, and it puts it in a way that I really like. It says, remember that every image of God is only a glimpse. I like that wording because this is one of those commandments that I think we like to skip over in our churches. Uh, we think, oh, I don't bow down to idols. Anyone here going down and bowing down to idols? Probably not. We don't have this problem, right? Except that we do. We just express it differently than some people might. We like to make God easy to understand. 
We make graven images of God in our hearts and in our minds whenever we forget that every image we have of God is just a glimpse of how great and big God really is. So whenever we start to think that we know everything there is to know about God, whenever we try to put God in a box, whenever we become so entrenched in our beliefs and our comfort zones that God can't surprise us anymore by showing up and doing new things, whenever we think that God can't surprise us by giving us a new mission in life, by working in people that we least expect it, whenever we think that we completely understand God and we control God, we are guilty of making graven images. When we think that we know what God looks like or how God works or, or what exactly church could be, whenever we try to set God in stone according to our liking and what we want God to be, that is making a graven image. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And therefore, we have to be careful about the assumptions we make about who God is and what God can do, and, and to try not to put limits on God. So we have to ask ourselves, are we moving forward? Are we always asking where God is leading us, what God is going to surprise us with next, or are we acting like we're the ones in control, like we are the potter and God is the clay? Are we trying to cast God in a stone that will never be able to hold God, or are we letting God be God? So that's number two. Now, number three. You, will not take, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. This is another interesting one. I think a few weeks ago I asked the kids what this commandment meant, and someone said, it means not using God's name as a swear word. Growing up, that's how I was taught too, and I think that's part of the meaning. We Baptists, when I was growing up, we were very serious about this. In fact, in kindergarten once, I got in trouble because I had a friend named Molly. And once I said to Molly, I was quoting that old song, I was like, good golly, Miss Molly. And I got pulled aside by a teacher who informed me that golly is just a silly way of saying God, and therefore I was using the Lord's name in vain. So, oops, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't take it that seriously anymore, but the Baptists definitely did. And I think the commandment is about that, but I think it's also about more than that. Certainly, we should be careful with our language. There's verses all over the Bible telling us to be careful with how we use God's name. But I think this isn't just about swearing. I also like the way that in flesh theology puts this one. They say, do not use God's name to do harm. You see, this flows out of those other commandments. If you forget that God alone is God, if you reduce God to nothing more than an image, well then the next step after making God into a graven image is to start using that image as a weapon. How much evil in the world is done in God's name? How many pastors or priests get away with abuse or stealing or, or hiding behind the name of God? How often do we justify our prejudices and our biases and our hatred by pretending we're doing God's work? And how many unjust wars do countries all over the world get into by saying, this is God's will? If God is God, if God is not a graven image, then God is certainly not a weapon that we get to wield in our own way to do whatever we want. And so do not use God's name to do harm. That's number three. And then there's number four. You might be familiar with number four because I preached on it for like three weeks. <laughs> number four, remember the Sabbath. I'll keep this one brief since hopefully you already get this one, but uh, we can still uh, look at it in the context of the Ten Commandments. This one also flows out of that first commandment because if God is God, then work is not God. And that can be really hard, I think, for a lot of Americans. I think sometimes we worship the hustle instead of God. We worship work. We treat our own hard work as if that work was our creator, 
that provides for us and cares for us. Which is really another way of saying we think ourselves are God and we think we provide for ourselves. We trust our work to bring us joy and happiness, maybe more than anything else. But, but if God is God, that means work is not. Now, work is important. Work is the way that we care for the world that God gave us. But we have to find time to set aside the work and remember that it is really God who provides for us. It is really God who brings us joy. God is God. Work is not. Success is not. Money is not. And when it says, thou shalt have no other gods before me, this is part of what it means. So that's number four. Number five, honor your father and your mother. This one's not just for the kids, again. Because I liked how in flesh theology puts it. They say, care for those who have cared for you. So whether that's your biological parents, your grandparents, an aunt or uncle, or even just a friend. We all have had people care for us when we could not care for ourselves. And so this commandment means give back to them. Care for them in their time of need. Remember that God is God. And God is that ultimate parent. God gives us people who are made in God's image. We don't have graven images because the image that God gave us is each other. And we have to care for each other when we are helpless. So we honor God by honoring our parents and everyone else who has cared for us. Number six, you shall not kill. This one's another one that I think is kind of easy to dismiss. Who here has murdered somebody? Don't raise your hand. I'm just... <laughs> it's easy to dismiss this one and say, well, I'm not a murderer, so I don't have to worry about that one. But do we let other people do our killing for us? Does the way we live do harm to others, even if we might not notice it right away? I think of who made the clothes that we wear, and how much were they paid to make those clothes? Who mined the materials that power our cell phones and our cars, and what effect did that have on their health? Does the way we live encourage division or violence? Does the way we speak to each other encourage violence? Do the things we think, do we do things that harm other people in our planet? And even if they might not cause death immediately, lead to death in the long run. This commandment is about so much more than just, you know, stabbing someone with a knife. It's about doing no harm to the image of God that we have in each other. Now, if all of that sounds really overwhelming, I get it. <laughs> no one can do this alone in a violent world. In our world, it sometimes feels like violence is the only thing on the menu. You're always choosing between two bad options. And that's why this commandment is not just for individuals. This commandment is for the whole community. How do we become a country? How do we become a world? And most importantly, how do we become a church? that does not cause, that does everything in our power to avoid causing suffering and death for others, even if it's just indirectly. Now, we're a long way from peace on earth, and I'm not going to pretend that it's going to be simple and that we just need to hold hands and sing kumbaya and everything will be perfect. But we do have a goal to work for. And that goal, as we work toward that goal, we are powered by the grace of God. And this, again, it flows out of that first commandment because if God is God, instead of violently grasping for graven images, instead we need to learn to see that image of God in each other. See every person as made in God's image and do no harm to that image of God in them. So that's number six. Number seven, you shall not commit adultery. It's an outgrowth, again, of that last commandment of doing no harm to others. If you've made a commitment of marriage to someone, love your spouse. Be faithful to them and remember that they are a beloved child of God 
who is God. And remember that they are made in God's image and don't do anything to harm that image. Now, if you're not married, good, good news, you're off the hook, right? Just kidding. You're not. Wrong. <laughs> this commandment also reminds us to honor any commitments we make with each other, any covenants that we make with each other. Don't betray the important relationships in your life in order to kind of benefit yourself. Don't use people as if they're nothing more than objects that exist for your benefit. It seems easy to understand. It seems easy to practice. But many of us fail when that rubber hits the road. Our commitment to our marriage, our commitment to our friends, our commitment to our coworkers, to anyone else has to rest, has to be based on our commitment, our covenant that we have with God the God who gives us the grace every day that we need to show up and be an example of how to be faithful. So that's number seven. Number eight, you shall not steal. Another one that I find easy to dismiss because I don't usually go rob banks or anything. That's not something I do for fun. Maybe, I don't know about you. But we should think more broadly. If we think more broadly about what stealing can look like, uh, we live in a world where people are overworked and underpaid, where we can get cheap products, but the only reason our products are so cheap is because someone overseas is working for pennies. We can get a bargain price even here because even here companies underpay their workers so that they can bring in more profits. And so we benefit from this cycle of stealing. Our world works in such a way that it creates poverty, and then people in poverty are desperate, and so they steal, which creates another victim who ends up desperate. And there's just this endless cycle that we are almost stuck in, that it's almost impossible to step out of. So this, again, it's not just individual acts of stealing, but it's about these vicious cycles that our world creates and about how we step out of those and show the world a different way of living. And again, this is another one where there's no quick and easy solution, but we have a goal to work for. We have a goal to work for a world where people are paid what they are owed. A world where no one is stolen from, a world where everyone is able to enjoy the fruits of their labor that they earn. The God who gives the Ten Commandments is the same God who led Israel out of slavery. And so God is God, and God hears the cry of the slave. God hears the cry of the unpaid worker made in God's image. God hears the cry of the victims of theft. And God will give us the grace to slowly break this cycle of thievery that this world runs on. So number eight, we have number nine. Almost done. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Don't lie to get your way, in other words. Don't prevent justice from being done. But this commandment, again, if, as you can imagine, there's more than just what it appears on the surface. Not only should we not lie, but Christians should be known as truthful people. I think sometimes people think tell the truth and they think this is a reason to be cruel to someone in the name of God. And they say, I'm just telling it like it is. But is that truth? Or is that using God's name in vain as a mask to, dis, dis, to disguise a desire to be mean to someone? Is that really telling the truth? But then on the other hand, we have like the opposite end of the, the spectrum where uh, there's this idea that we just tell people what they want to hear all the time, even if it's not true. And this is the one I struggle with personally because we often fear conflict and we do anything we can to avoid it. We, we try to be polite to each other. We keep the peace. We lie to ourselves and we tell ourselves everything's fine, I'm not offended, I'm not upset. And because we're lying to ourselves, we go and lie to each other about the problems that might be kind of brewing under the surface of our politeness. And we never address those problems because we don't tell each other the truth. Is it any surprise that the God who refuses to be made into a graven image, also wants us to live the truth in our lives and not deceive people. So that's number nine. 
We have one more. Finally, number 10. You shall not covet. Don't covet anything that belongs to our neighbor. Personally, I think this is the hardest one for me. I don't know what you think. But we live in a world that wants us to covet so badly. Just think of how many advertisements you see every day. I, uh, a few months ago, I was trying to live out this commandment better. We were talking about it in Bible study at my old, at my old church. And so I made a commitment to myself that every time I saw an advertisement, I would stop and say a prayer thanking God for something I already had. So practicing gratitude. Go home and try it because you might give up pretty quickly. I did because you'll never get anything done. If you say a prayer every time you see an advertisement, think of how many billboards we see, how many things pop up on our phone, how many commercials come on, even just watching a sports game and people have advertisements everywhere. Because our world wants us to want things. It's almost anti-American to, to just be happy with what you already have. Every funny commercial, every flashy billboard, every jingle that gets stuck in our head for days at a time is a temptation to break this commandment. God is God, not money, not things, not wealth, not success. And we don't need to grasp for things because it is God who takes care of us and gives us what we need. If the first commandment sums up what all the other commandments are about, then I think this commandment, number 10, might sum up what our greatest temptation is. I think the reason often, the reason we seek out other gods, the reason we try to make God in our own image, the reason we use God as a weapon, definitely the reason we work and work all day and never stop to rest and worship, it's sometimes the reason we betray our family, our loved ones, the reason people lie and kill and steal. It's because we want things. We covet. We can worship God or we can worship things. Which gods are we worshiping? We can worship God or we can worship work. We can honor that image of God in our family, friends, and neighbors or we can destroy God's image or at least try to and take whatever we want. What are the Ten Commandments but a reminder that God is God and a call to worship God and God alone? And they, are, they remind us of how easy it can be to worship something besides God. Are you worshiping someone besides God in your life today? I know I often ask myself that question and too often the answer ends up being yes. But the Ten Commandments, they're not just a reminder. They are also grace. They are an act of grace. They are God pulling us back to what really matters in our life. They are God leading us to the right path. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. God is God. And if we get that one right, everything else kind of falls into place. So let's pray together. God, we thank you for the grace that you came down to our earth and, and spoke these words. And you spoke these words so that we might, not so that we could be punished or, or feel stuck, but so that we might have true life, true freedom. God, help us to follow your commandments, starting with the fact that we ought to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind. And love our neighbor, that image of God, love our neighbor as ourselves. Help us to get that right, and our world will become a better place for it. In your name, amen. Amen. amen.
God, do we have any joys or concerns today? Let's, do we have a microphone? Yes, sure. Okay. Let's start with this side of the room. Anybody on this side in the corner hiding back there? All right. How about this row right here? Yes. Shirley. Oh, please. Shirley, right? I got it right. I have a what? joy. My, hu my husband and my son. Phyllis. <laughs> Not Shirley. Sorry. <laughs> my husband and I are leaving Tuesday to go back to Virginia for his mother's birthday and I get to visit with my friends and we come back next Sunday. So you're going oh, to Virginia. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry I got your name Have right. a safe trip. Thank you. I have a concern. Has anybody heard from Ruth Gordon or knows her status right now? Mm -mm. Is she out of town, visiting, ill? Any, anybody heard from her? Mm -mm. I've tried to call her and I'm not getting any answer. Yes. Oh, she was? Okay, but you haven't heard whether she was leaving town or anything? Or? Okay, I called both her numbers and she got no answer. Yeah. Right. Okay, I thought she might have some illness and I was wondering if anybody had, had heard from her Let's at pray all. for Ruth and for, for all those who are missing. I also noticed Tom hasn't been here in a while, so if anyone knows. That's how true, he's doing. yeah. All right. 
Anyone else in this row? Anybody okay. else have a joy or concern they want to share with us today? We have a little, we're still in this room. Nope. Uh, first, I do have a, uh, a correction in the bulletin. The men's group at this Saturday at 8 a.m. is at Perkins, so I don't want the men to show up here. It's at Perkins, 8 a.m. next Saturday, and all men are uh, encouraged and welcome. And also, I have a joy. It's uh, my wife, Pat, who's a blessing in my life and the church. Uh, his birthday is Tuesday. God bless. Oh, yay. Happy birthday. And I would just like to say thank you to my wonderful husband, but also I want to wish Jen a happy birthday. We share the same day. All right. All right. That's good for Jen. So it was this past Tuesday or it's this coming Tuesday? Okay. So follow up to, yeah, I have a joy, follow up to last week. Um, Ghost Light Children's Theater performed Canterville Ghost on Friday and Saturday. They did an amazing job. I'm just super proud of them. Um, I think one of the joys that came, not only did the kids, I'm not only most, oh, and I should mention Lily Morrison was one of the leads, Autumn's daughter. She did an excellent job. Um, I was really proud of these kids, not just because of their performances. Um, some of the kids, we had some kids that were like fairly new to performing, oh, yeah. and they wound up with some fairly, fairly significant stage fright. And I was so proud of the other kids because they just like, grouped around them and loved on them and hugged them and got them through it. And I think I was prouder of that than I was necessarily of their performances because they just were so loving and supportive of one another. So, um, you know, sometimes we hear like lots of negative stuff about the kids, but there's some awesome kids out there. Amen. So. All right, I saw Lil up here. Oh, yes. Prayers for safe travel, because I'm going to take a break, too. Um, I'm leaving uh, very early Friday morning, and I'm going to St. Louis to see my grandson run in a conference race. Uh, he's one of their top track runners. And um, he's a senior this year, and I, thought, I haven't yet seen him run in a race, so I'm going to try to get that in. <laughs> it's one of my bucket list goals here. <laughs> oh, yay. All right. Anyone Anybody in this like row? Today? Oh, we got... Uh, Oh, Dave and Felicia. Thank you. Um, I don't normally do this kind of thing. It's kind of hard for me to stand up in front of everybody and ask for prayers. Uh, I, but um, my son was here with us a, a few weeks ago, and, and uh, he, he deals with a lot of struggles in his life. And um, we always appreciate prayers for him, and I'm always praying for him. And, and one of the prayers that I, I'm trying to say for him all the time is that it's in your hands, God. You know, please do your will to 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 make life okay for him. And and I think I need prayers for myself because even though I say that prayer, I think I have a hard time letting God do what He needs to do. And and I try and 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 take it all on myself to try and save him. And and um, just in this time right now, I need I need prayers to help me trust in God more to do what God will What's do. What's your son's so. name? Justin. Justin. That's right. I met him. All right. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, I sometimes we have to just let go, let God, you know. I saw Felicia had her hand up, but she might have gone <laughs> running after Everly. Oh, she, oh, who wants to speak? You going to let her let Everly your husband does. speak? Okay, good. <laughs> That's a blessing. Uh, yeah, my um, friend in Oklahoma, I call him my brother in Oklahoma. He had a baby two weeks ago and baby's back home and healthy and happy and the family's very healthy and happy uh, so they, they had to spend a couple of weeks in ICU because the uh, baby is premature um, and now they're home and safe and happy so okay. thank you for your prayers all the that's how oh, it yeah. that's how yeah Remind that's me, how what was his name Roscoe that's yep. that's right because I thought that was so cute Okay. All Very right. Good. I have one that was in the offering. It's for Ski and BK for his health issues and for diagnostic clarity. So let's keep praying for that. All right. 
Anyone else that I missed? Then let's go ahead and pray. God, we thank you that you are God. You are God alone, and, and that means all of these ways of our world that off, so often seem to fail and to leave us empty, leave us disappointed, those are not what life is really about. You call us home, you give us freedom, and you bring us life. And so, God, today we want to thank you for the things that have given us life in this past week, for baby Roscoe who's come home, and for Pat's birthday and Jen's birthday coming up, for this play with the, the Ghost Light Theater that Karen and these kids worked so hard on that, that it went well and that these kids were able to love each other and, and support each other. Thank you for everyone who is getting to travel, for Phyllis traveling to Virginia, keep her safe and help her to have a good trip. And for Lil as well, who finally gets to see her grandkid. Thank you for all these joyful things. I'm seeing so many joys today. But God, we also have some concerns. We want to pray for those of us who are missing today, for Ruth and for Tom and for anyone else who couldn't be here for any reason whatsoever, that whatever's going on with them, you would protect them and love them and help them to get a Sabbath rest today for uh, Dave and his, his son Justin, that this difficult situation is uh, resolved and that Dave is able to take care of himself during it and that you take Justin into your hands and protect him and lead him to the place he needs to be, God. God, thank you. for We want to pray for Ski and BK as well, that their health issues and diagnostic clarity clears up and they can find what's going on. And God, we want to pray for everyone in our world, the people in Florida who are recovering from this disaster, for people all over the world who are dealing with disasters and violence and, and everything that goes on in our world today, God. God, lead us to the right world. Build our world anew and give us new life. Teach us to pray as well as you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Could we please stand if you're able? This song, the, the words might not be familiar, but the tune should probably be familiar once you hear it. You'll be like, ah, oh, I know that one. And, so. and I'm thankful I have a choir here help supporting us today. <laughs> Yeah. 
Be sure to join us for coffee and snacks in the back there and get to know some people. Otherwise, as you go forth this week, may God live through you and show God's grace through you that the whole world may see the image of God. Go in peace.